So the second half, 5.1, was looking at really looking at mitosis. It was the first of all the three stages of the cell cycle. What was the first of the three stages? Not the four stages of mitosis. What was the first of the three stages of the cell cycle? Interphase cell grows, does its thing, and near the end there was one more thing that happened. Uh, oh, DNA replicates. Okay. Then there was mitosis, which we broke down into four stages. Mitosis was the process by which the cell basically replicates without quite splitting in two. Everything but that. What were the four stages of mitosis? I do remember the, fra the, the PMAT. I remember that was the acronym. So the first one began with a P. Prophase, oh, prepare, Pro prophase, prepare. What was the big thing that was going on in the preparation stage? What happened? I'm giving you a hint as to questions I might ask in the future, by the way. So the big thing in the, in the prophase is that you get the chromosomes forming in their classic X, X shape. Sometimes they've started to, this is why there's some vagueness in the, in the stages. Sometimes they've already started to form at the end of interphase. But yet, I'm going to say in prophase, part of the prepare, chromosomes form the DNA, which was spaghettified. It's duplicated, and it forms into the X shapes that are ready to get split in half so that half the DNA goes with one cell and another identical copy goes with the other cell. What was the next stage after prophase? Metaphase. metaphase. What happened in metaphase? All the chromosomes line up in the middle. I don't think I'm going to ask you the mechanism by which that happens. We had those spindle fibers and those centrioles, and they were linking onto molecules, and it looked kind of like giant spider webs. I'm not going to freak out about that. You'll dive into that much more, I think, in Biology 11 or Biology 12 if you take that. So the chromosomes are now lined up in the middle. What was the next stage? Anaphase. What happened there? What was a dumb way to remember that? Oh, a way apart. Okay, that was when the DNA, the chromosomes split and an identical copy goes one way, an identical copy goes the other way. What else after that? What was telophase? It's not two different cells. I have to completely, con there's two, di two identical nuclei in one big cell still. They're still linked by a big strip of flesh or whatever you want to call it. There's not skin, a big st oh, a cell membrane. They're still linked. And then we backed out, that was the end of mitosis. What was the final cell stage? Cytokinesis. What happens there? That's when the cells actually split. And right around then, also a little bit at the end of telophase, but right around then also, all of the extra organelles form as well. The endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi bodies. Mitochondria usually has formed before then already, so some of the organelles have already been uh, cloned. But Okay. That is asexual reproduction. That is reproduction without... Oh, what's the definition of asexual reproduction? Reproduction with only one parent. Reproduction with only one parent. And what this means, Paige, is that the offspring are identical, ident, I, boy, did I spell that wrong, intent, identical to each other and the parent. And what I mean by identical is genetically identical. An identical genetic copy of the parent is called A, starts with the letter C, then there's an L, then there's an O, clone. You've heard the term in sci-fi movies. It's actually a science term. If offspring are identical DNA, genetically identical to their parents, that's a clone. And it isn't just cells, it isn't just cells, Amy, that reproduce this way. There are actually larger life forms that reproduce this way. There are some advantages. It's really fast. You don't have to spend time trying to find a mate. There is no mating process. It's really fast. And so typically these produce Lots of young. And as I said, no need 
to find a mate. There are, however, also some disadvantages, which is why not all life forms reproduce this way. Evolution has come up with probably a better system. So the disadvantages, you have a lack of variation in the offspring. And what that means is they are all susceptible, for example, to the same disease, the same poor conditions. If something goes wrong, it can wipe out the entire population and none of them might survive. Uh, the other issue with this is because you don't need a second body because one parent is reproducing, all the offspring often end up in the same location. And that means that they are competing for the same food and same space. And that can be bad. Brooklyn, what did I say the first advantage was? It's, it can be really fast. So we're going to do a little math here. If you have on day one, one whoop, let's try that again. If you have on day one, one cell, and let's suppose it doubles every day. How many would you have after on day two? Then? Then? Eight? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. 64? Yep. 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 I got that already. 8,192. And then it's going to be 16,000. 192 is really close to 200. So it's going to be almost 16,400. Except it's going to be 8 less and 8 less. So 400 minus 16. It's going to be 384, I believe. Okay. Should we keep going? I can probably do it in my head, but heck, let's go to our calculator now. So I have... It's 3276. Let me make sure I did this one right, because it's first thing in the morning and my brain isn't... Yeah, I was right. I should have trusted myself. So I'm going to go like this. Times 2. And it gets pretty big pretty fast. In fact, I've tried going all the way to 30 days, and usually my calculator can't handle it, and I've got a better calculator than most of you have. Uh, now, this is every day. What if it only takes them, for example, an hour to reproduce? This is why sometimes you'll get sick, you'll get a bacteria or a virus, and you can almost feel it going through your body. You start to feel a little achy, and like an hour later, you're like, wow, I feel way sicker. There are certain viruses you can almost just feel. These suckers are reproducing really fast. Most bacteria and most viruses only need one parent. A mass of cells, if these were cells, become visible to the eye at approximately one millimeter in width, which is about 250,000 cells. On what day would this group of cells be visible? I guess we are going to have to continue. So let me start over here. Day 15, we had 16,384. Then it was times two. Day 16 was 32,768. We're going to count. So this was day what? 32,768 is day what? And then we have, oh, let's try that again. 16,384 times 2. So that was day 16. Oh, I got to use my answer button, Mr. Duick. That was dumb of me. So we're going to go like this, times 2. Here's day 17. Day 18. Day 19. You know what? Right there already, you'd start to be able to see it with the naked eye. So day 19. 
if this is a cancerous cell, you can see why we say it's so important. As soon as you notice something, go to the doctor right away. You can never go too early. Get yourself tested right away. There are five types of asexual reproduction. And as much as I hate memorization, I will probably ask you these five types so you can make a little note. This would be a good list question to ask you on a test. You can make flashcards or study guides later on and I'll be including them in a crossword puzzle. The first one is one that we call binary fission. Binary fission. You can pronounce it fission or fission. Both are accepted. The second one we call budding. Jimmy says, I thought that's what I was doing when I hang with my friends. We're budding, man. No, buds are different. The third type is called fragmentation. The fourth type is called spores. And the fifth type is called vegetative reproduction. How many types? I bet you now we're going to look at each type and I'll explain what each one is. That would probably make sense. So binary fission. This is usually used in single-celled bacteria, uh, amoeba, Paramecium, you may have looked at swamp water and seen through a microscope those little single-celled life forms. They are animals. They are life forms. So in an amoeba, a parent cell replicates its DNA and then divides in two. This is just like cell division in humans, but our cells are not life forms complete and independent on their own. They are part of us and they make up a larger life form. So since an amoeba is an independent little tiny life form on its own, we, call, we say then it's the actual entire organism that's reproducing. And the other one that I said does this is bacteria. So in bacteria, bacteria have a very simple DNA structure, which is why they can reproduce so fast. So bacteria only have one big circular chromosome. So they don't go through mitosis, which means they can shave some time off of the reproduction process. They can reproduce really, really fast. But the DNA is duplicated and then the cell divides as a picture, as a model, it looks something like this. So here is a bacteria with this strange circular chromosome. Our chromosomes tend to be X-shaped, theirs are not. And it clones itself and then it divides and you have two new identical bacteria. So what are some of the characteristics of binary fission? It is really fast. Because you have all these new cells being produced, and Quentin, because it's a less complicated, simpler model of duplicating the DNA, more can actually go wrong. It can mutate rapidly. This is how bacteria develop antibiotic resistance so quickly. It's why you need a different flu shot every year. It's why in the past 20 years we've realized in the medical community, so an antibiotics, they really, the first one was penicillin. It started in the 1940s and they saved probably billions of lives. But especially in the 60s and 70s and 80s, doctors were prescribing them willy-nilly like crazy. You're sick? Here's some antibiotics. Take it and you'll feel better. The problem was then 
the, all the bacteria weren't killed by that antibiotics. Most of them were, but the ones that survived survived because they had mutated and they were now somewhat immune to that antibiotic and then they would start to reproduce. Well, now you got to use a different antibiotic. Oh, and then the ones that survived that batch, now you got to use a different antibiotic. You may have even heard the term superbugs. We have built those inadvertently ourselves because we were sloppy with antibiotics. We were prescribing them all the time. And the ones that survived were so tough, they had mutated so tough, that right now there's very little that can kill them. So now what we're doing is we're saying, you know what, Mara, are you sick? Go home, put your feet up, have some chicken soup. You'll get better in about a week. It's not worth trying to cut your illness down by three or four days by giving you some antibiotics. Your body will provide, will produce, will create its own antibodies of its own, and you'll get better, especially in our Western world where we have good nutrition and good health to begin with. So we're trying to avoid prescribing antibiotics, and I'm telling you this as young adults. If your doctor says, well, here's some antibiotics, have the conversation with your doctor. Will I get better without these? then maybe I don't want these. We only have a few more. We have reserved certain antibiotics in our arsenal. I think we have two more main types that we can bring out. But once the bacteria develop a resistance to those, it could be like, you see, you've all grown up. When you get a cut, if you cut yourself, what do you do? Ouch. Yeah, then what? Ouch. No, seriously. Okay, you wash it, you clean it, you put a Band-Aid on the, the reason is also that we have created a very sterile environment. Most bacteria don't survive in our environment. If you cut yourself 100 years ago, the odds are it was going to fester, it was going to get infected, you're either going to die or you're going to lop it off, which is why you saw so many amputated people in old pictures after wars and things. That was our best line of defense. There is a chance 40 or 50 years from now we might end up back there if we're just very casual with antibiotics. So... Again, Brianna, if your doctor says, take an antibiotic, will I get better without it? Thanks, doc. I understand that you wanted me to shorten my illness. I, I, I can go okay without it. Is that what you say? Pardon me? Is that what you say? I ask. Really? Oh, yes. Always. I ask. Always. Okay? Uh, it's why you need a different flu shot every year. Now, the flu is a more serious illness. People actually can die from the flu, not so much among young people, not so much in our, quote, Western world where we have better nutrition. But, for example, in 19, I'm going to say 17, I think it was, we had this thing that they called the Spanish flu. It wiped out about one-tenth of the world's population. Uh, one in ten young people died from it. It was a weird flu. Most of the time, the flu doesn't kill healthy kids. This killed healthy kids. So you can imagine at our school of a thousand, a hundred students would have died from the flu that year. And then the other reason this flu is very, very uh, mysterious. It's, it's mysterious. We don't understand. It was very virulent, which means very, very fatal. Every woman who was pregnant who got it died. I think it had a 90% or 99% kill rate. If you were pregnant and you got it, you died. We don't know why that was the case. So Get your flu shots. Back to here. Um, in this, then, there is no mixing of genes. Genetic material doesn't get exchanged. So apart from any mutations, and the mutations occur because you're reproducing so often that there's a bigger likelihood that something goes wonky, uh, all the offspring are all... Oh, instead of identical, what word can I use that begins the letter C? Oh. Clones. So that's binary fission. Our cells do it. Single-celled organisms like amoeba and bacteria reproduce that way. You've all turned the page, apparently. Budding. These are multicellular organisms. Uh, a lot of these are underwater on the seafloor, for example. Um, organisms that we call hydras. H-Y-D-R-A-S and sea sponges. Okay. When the organism is ready to reproduce, a little bud forms on the side 
and then eventually it grows into an entire organism. It breaks off, lands nearby, and forms a new individual. It's sort of like how plants release a seed, except instead of a seed, you release... You know what? Groot from the Guardians of the Galaxy movies... If you look at it, he reproduced by budding because in the first one he was destroyed. They kept a little tiny piece of Groot. It became a little baby Groot. If you saw the Avengers movie on the weekend, he's now a sullen teenager Groot. I can't relate to any of that, teaching teenagers. Okay, that would be a good example. So characteristics of that. Uh, what you end up then is uh, you end up with colonies in one place because Usually, these are life forms that don't have their own means of locomotion. They can't walk around or crawl around or uh, some cells have that little tail that can push them around. They don't have any of that, usually. Although, for example, if you're in the ocean with the ocean currents, the buds can also move away to start new colonies, except it's not their choice. They're at the whims of nature, of wind if they're above ground, of ocean currents if they're under the water. Again, there is very little genetic variation, so all of the individuals will be affected by the same issues. We're finding that right now with the fact that the oceans have started to warm up in certain areas. We're finding whole massive areas of the ocean floor is dying off, whether it's coral or sea sponges. We're just finding because they can't adapt and they're all genetically identical. So they're particularly susceptible to climate change. Which is real. Sorry. What was the first one? Binary fission. Second one, budding, not hanging out with your friends. That's something different. Third one, fragmentation. Uh, these are simple organisms. Uh, sea stars, what you probably called starfish, but they're not fish. So the proper name is sea stars. They live under the sea and they look like a star. Uh, some plants, if an individual is broken into pieces, some or all of the pieces can regrow into an entire individual. If any of you are into gardening, this is what you can do when you can take a shoot or an offspring, a little piece of a plant and put it in some water and it will start to send out roots and you'll get a whole new plant. Uh, some pictures. Oh, I thought I had pictures here. Oh, I do, but first a uh, little. Uh, sea stars were eating too many shellfish in an area. So the fishermen caught the sea stars, cut them up, and threw them back into the water because they figured the fish would eat them. What happened instead? All these small pieces, most of these small pieces grew into their own sea stars. They inadvertently dramatically multiplied the population. Oops. Uh, plants can do this too. If you take a piece and you put it in water, new roots will often form. So uh, Eurasian milfoil is an underwater weed in the Okanagan. This is part of a, this is a problem because of this. Invasive species can be a problem because of this. So some pictures, right? You'll uh, you will sometimes if you see a whole bunch of I'll call them starfish, sea stars. I was raised, they were called starfish, and so I always have to think sea stars. Uh, you'll see a whole bunch of them underwater. If you look close, though, you may see some that are missing a limb. Probably it was lost to a predator or something like that, and you might see that the limb is starting to grow back. We're studying that because if we can learn how to do that in humans, that would mean that if you're in an accident and you, lo you, you lose a limb, there should be, I mean, it grew once when it was in your mother's womb. There should be some way to re-trigger that mechanism, maybe. Okay. This is fragmentation as well. Um, and here, taking some leaves, taking a twig, putting it in water, and often you'll get an entirely new plant forming. Some of the characteristics. Again, you may notice a common theme. It can spread quickly. And they're really tough to kill. For example, if you had all these underwater weeds 
and you thought, I'll go in with a weed whacker and just shred them. Will that work? You'll probably actually have made the problem worse, right? Much like the fishermen did with the sea stars. Third one, or fourth, third one? Fourth one. Vegetative reproduction. Strawberries do this. So strawberries and other similar plants, they send out what we call runners. These are small plants that stay connected to the parent plant for nutrients, etc., until they get established. Once they've established their own root system and can bring in their own nutrients from the ground, then that connecting runner will die off and now you have a completely separate plant. So if you're ever in a strawberry field, if you're picking strawberries sometime, take a look and notice that. You'll see these little runners going out all over the place. They're not weeds. The strawberries are trying to create new plants. Characteristics. So the new plants are supported until they're established. It's sort of like they have a parent looking after them. Kind of. Uh, it means that you're always very close to the parent plant. Which can be a negative. That can lead to competition. For nutrients, for water, for sunlight, etc. And if there's not enough nutrients going around, it can lead to the plant being less healthy. It may be necessary for farmers to go in and cull some to remove some of the strawberry plants just to make sure there's enough nutrients. And even though you might say, well, won't there be less strawberries? Well, no, the ones that do remain might be healthier and produce more strawberries. Uh, if you allow, Another category for this vegetative reproduction is if you allow cuttings to form roots that can also fit within this category as well. So an example is uh, what we call grafting. How many of you heard the term before, graft? Okay. Some plants apple trees, for example, they can't actually grow roots from cuttings. If you take a, a twig of an apple tree and you put it in water, that twig will not suddenly start to develop a root system. Some plants will. Apple trees won't. So what farmers do is they take a branch of the tree that they want and they graft it onto a plant that has a root system established. So you have a small base, a small trunk that has roots Usually you slice it at an angle like that. Here's the one that you've taken from a different plant. You try and slice it so that they fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. You wrap it and then often you coat it in wax to seal it and they will become one plant. This is how we have developed, we have bred all these different types of apples, all the different flavors of apples that you see. It's when you graft, oh, I'll graft a Macintosh apple onto a Golden Delicious. What will I, what will I get now? And over generations, you get, well, red apples and green apples and golden apples and all these different flavors of apples. Uh, how many of you ever had a Granny Smith apple? The really green sour ones? Some people like them, some people don't. I think those were, it's called Granny Smith. I think it was a woman in Australia. That apple tree on its own form, it grafted itself somehow in nature. All of a sudden she noticed she had this tree that was producing different <coughs> apples for the rest in her orchard. And then I think a farmer bought that tree, after the orchard after she had died. And every Granny Smith apple tree comes from that original. He named it after her. A little nerd trivia for you there. So some characteristics here. The added branch has a special name. It begins with the letter S. We call it a scion. The C is silent. Although if you say scion, I'll know what you mean. The added branch has the benefit of a strong, well-established root system. 
Uh, the other reason this is done is grafted trees produce fruit within a few years, while growing from a seed takes much, much, much longer, sometimes decades. And if you're a farmer who's invested in an orchard, you can't wait that long to make any money back. Grafting can also control the size of the tree. So, for example, you might have the root be a dwarf variety of your particular fruit or tree, a tree that's naturally smaller. If you graft a branch from a larger type of tree, it will still keep the overall tree smaller, even if the added branch is from a larger species. Why might you want it smaller? It's easier to pick the fruit if it's lower to the ground. I wrote here, this spring, notice the trees in front of the gym. We may have missed it, I'm not sure, but in front of the gym, one of those blossoming trees, one of the branches blossoms in a different color than the rest of the blossoms. I can't remember which tree it is. So either someone has grafted a branch on there or a mutation has occurred. It's possible, perhaps, that there was some kind of a disease years ago that may have affected that branch and changed the, the colors of the blossoms. But I do notice, if you look closely, one of the branches completely different blossoms from the rest of the trees on that branch. Little nerd trivia for you there. Spore formation. I think this was the last one of the five, was it not? I think. Correct. Uh, okay. So spore formation, this is a single cell that's able to develop into a whole new organism. Typically, these cells are very lightweight, so they can travel long distances on the wind. Ferns and mushrooms reproduce this way. They release their spores to the wind. The wind carries them on the breeze, and that's how they spread. Also, typically, these can survive pretty harsh conditions. In fact, there are some spores that can actually survive hundreds of years without starting to develop if conditions aren't good. So there are some spores, for example, if there is drought, if there's no water, They'll hibernate for years and years or even decades. Or extreme temperature. Uh, there are some that can survive forest fires. In fact, there are some that wait for a forest fire and that triggers them after the fire has gone. That change in temperature triggers them to grow because they know there's going to be a whole bunch of nutritious ash that they can use as part of their nutrients to grow. And ash makes a good fertilizer. So this is a table right from your textbook. Did I include it in your notes? I can't remember. No. So you might want to make a little note. Table 5.1, advantages and disadvantages. This might be some good multiple choice E kind of questions. Which of the following are some advantages? Or this might be a good list question. So what are some advantages? Large numbers are reproduced very quickly. You only need one parent. Large colonies can form and if you have a really big colony, it can outcompete other life forms. You can starve out every other life form because every life form is competing with every other life form technically in nature. Large numbers of organisms means that species may survive when conditions or the number of predators change. You might get two or three of the millions that survive, and those two or three are enough to start a new colony. You don't have to waste energy trying to find a mate. Disadvantages. Because they're genetic clones, a negative mutation can make them susceptible to disease and can destroy large numbers of offspring because all of the clones would have that same negative mutation. Some methods of asexual reproduction produce offspring that are so close together they compete for food and space. And again, unfavorable conditions such as extreme temperatures or what we're noticing with ocean 
temperature changes can wipe out entire colonies, entire areas. The Great Barrier Reef, for example, is dying off in Australia. Cloning. So the five methods of asexual reproduction are all examples of cloning, but they only work for very simple plants and animals. They don't work for complex organisms. We can clone them, but we have to do it artificially in the lab. So some myths and some reality. Now I have to be honest, this handout here I made in 2015, and even just in the three years, I suspect that there have been huge changes. I'll talk about one at the end if you remind me to talk about CRISPR. What? CRISPR. So we have human-assisted cloning. Why? Well, one thing we're trying to do is to save genetic information from an endangered species. Endangered species. What movie franchise has made a complete living out of playing on this idea? There's a yet another one coming out this summer. The last title, the last, the second word of the movie is world. It begins letter J. Okay, the whole Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, those are all cloned dinosaurs. We have talked about, could we, we do have uh, woolly mammoth, mammoth. D, we, we have woolly mammoth DNA. And it's, it's, we think, intact. You really wouldn't know until you tried. And so it has debated, could we get an embryo, say, from an elephant, which is a similar species, implant that into an elephant's womb? Could we clone a woolly mammoth? And then we watch Jurassic Park and we say, boy, huge furry elephants running around. Maybe we need to think that through. Um, you can also mass produce an organism with desired characteristics. Okay. A lot of the plants and vegetables that we buy are clones. Bananas are primarily clones, for example. This led to a major issue. Your grandparents, your great-grandparents ate far tastier bananas than you ever did. So the banana from the 40s and 50s and 60s was the Cavendish, and it was a delicious, very tasty banana. And because it was the number one seller all over the world, banana company, banana orchards, they're not called orchards, I can't remember what it's, plantations, started to primarily focus on the Cavendish, and then in the mid-1960s, a virus wiped them out all over the entire planet, because they were all clones of each other. They're gone, they're extinct. Uh, the current bananas that you eat right now, which are pretty good, uh, they're also under threat from a virus. Uh, a bunch of countries have lost their whole stock. And so we're fighting a battle to see if we can keep this one. But already scientists are trying to crossbreed different bananas. They want one that's nice and sweet, that's tasty, that lasts longer, right? Um, the other one we're hoping to do, and I kind of hope it happens in your lifetime, is uh, to make new, no, organs. Okay. So, for example, we can make new skin. For, uh, you can put in brackets, i.e., skin for burn victims. Although it sounds a little bit gross, they are trying to see if they can produce pigs, because pigs are about the same size and mass and internal structure as human beings, where they could harvest the pig organs and implant them in humans. And although on one can't really. But on the other hand, if someone's going to die, really? Yeah. Okay. So what's uh, some of the few, wh what's some of the future? Growing transplant organs in pigs, you might be able to actually have that organ have enough of your DNA that your body wouldn't reject it. Treating Parkinson's disease, 
What's Parkinson's disease? Oh, it's like, you know. What is it, Jimmy? Yeah, what? Like, what are the symptoms of Parkinson's? You're right. Shaking? Yeah, so Michael J. Fox is the Canadian actor who got what's called young onset Parkinson's. It yeah. often yeah. does happen... Yeah, it, it often happened. Uh, perhaps he had the symptoms of Parkinson's. We're not sure if it was Parkinson's or something that was a result of being hit in the head so much as a fighter. So there's debate on that still. Um, it usually hits older people if it's going to hit. So my uncle is battling Parkinson's and he can do some things. So, for example, he can still drive because when he's holding the stick shift and the steering wheel, his hands are steady. But eating is, is troublesome. Um, but it does hit young people too. One of the reasons Michael J. Fox became so famous is I think it started for him when he was 32 or 33, which is very young. He actually managed to hide it for a couple of years because Hollywood is a big gossip fest and he was the star of a, one of the number one TV shows, Spin City, at the time. And so he may, would make up all sorts of excuses when he needed to go into his trailer and just shake for a while so that people wouldn't see that. He actually managed, I think he even had brain surgery without anybody knowing about it, which is pretty impressive, I guess, as a secret. But he has now become an ambassador for Parkinson's disease to try and cure it. Uh, the other big one we'd love to be able to do, we'd love to be able to grow, regrow someone's spinal cord in a lab so that people that are paralyzed or if we could get their spinal cords inside their bodies to regrow. Because again, it grew once when you were in your mother's womb. Why can't we do that again? That would be such a game changer. So spinal, I guess I meant to say spinal cord injuries. There, take off the S. Spinal cord injuries, etc. The first large size animal to be cloned was a sheep. They named her Dolly. And this would have been 1995-ish, so a little more than 20 years ago. Okay. So all cells have all of the DNA. Every cell in your body has all of the information needed for the whole organism. Your stomach cells have the information to run brain cells. That DNA is it, it's the same DNA. Your liver cells, DNA, has the information to run skin cells. It's all there. But in each cell, they have, I'll put this in quotes, forgotten how to use most of the DNA. They only know how to use that which they need for interface. So scientists took the DNA from an adult cell and they put it into an egg that had had its nucleus. And by egg, I don't mean chicken egg, I mean sheep egg. Yes? Yeah. Okay. They'd removed the nucleus. So, oh, where is all the DNA stored? Inside the nucleus. They'd removed the old DNA and replaced the new DNA. Now this was very, very complicated. You're talking microscopically small. This egg was then implanted in a host mother. And Dolly was allowed to grow. So this sheep birthed Dolly, but Dolly had no DNA in common with the sheep. Dolly's DNA was a clone of the original DNA. Put your pencils down, look up. So, scientists removed the nucleus of an egg cell from a female sheep, and then a mammary gland cell is removed from an adult female sheep. This cell and the egg cell are placed next to each other in a bath of chemicals. We actually use some electricity to cause them to fuse. And because the cells have fused, but there's only one nucleus, that nucleus takes over operation of the entire cell. So there's the fused cell. The fused cell begins dividing to form an embryo. The embryo is then implanted inside a mother. So Dolly was born on July 5th, 1996. Uh, she died young, 
but non-cloned sheep often do as well. There was a virus on the farm that she lived on and other sheep died. So we don't know whether she died young because something went weird in the cloning process or whether she died young because sheep die. It's not like they live to a ripe old age in most situations anyways. I don't know. There was no evidence that she was less healthy, but lots of cloned animals are very unhealthy or the embryos die very early. So lots of stuff goes wrong. And there is some evidence, at least there was when I did the research a few years ago, that cloned animals might have weaker immune systems. They, the fact that Dolly died from a virus, we see they seem to be more susceptible to getting sick. But it's such a small sample, it could just be a fluke. It's not like there's a million cloned animals out there that we can study carefully. It's only been, you know, a few. 2005, a dog was cloned, Snuppy. Okay. I think that was the first cloned dog. In the last 13 years, it's become even more common. Celebrities sometimes are paying big bucks. Barbara Streisand recently had her pet dog cloned because she liked it so much. Okay. Put your pencils down. Look.